Welcome to One Mind Zen. Tonight's Dharma talk is given by Robert Coho Epstein. The last time I had a, an opportunity to speak, um, I uh, spoke rather obsessively about the fourth skanda, uh, which has become a, a sticking point for me since I realized that it's the source of continuing generation of dukkha um and uh it, it's the uh the level of um of thought and emotion uh where more complicated complexes and proliferating thoughts and feelings are created um i'm sort of looking at that same uh phenomenon tonight uh from a slightly different angle um the uh, the nature of uh, what you could call glibly positive and negative thoughts and feelings, um, more uh, rightly uh, called skillful or unskillful thoughts and feelings, or in some translations, uh, wholesome or versus unwholesome, uh, and and uh, wholesome, unwholesome, uh, skillful, unskillful are both possible ways of translating the. Uh, the Pali uh, word kusala, um, kusala and a kusala. Um, so uh, in the Satipata, Satipatthana Sutta, Buddha talks about that process uh, in the fourth uh, foundation of mindfulness. So keeping that in mind, and I'll, I'll get back to it, uh, there's a kind of overlay created by the mind uh, through our thoughts and feelings. And something that I'm sure everyone who's practiced for a little while has noticed is that there's this kind of tension uh, between the present moment and our thoughts and feelings and evaluations of the present moment that seem to have this uh, uh, kind of pull towards taking us away from you know, just simply what the moment is uh, it always is exactly itself, and it's always something. And we we seem to have a a, a mental slash emotional response to whatever's happening in the moment of not being quite happy with it, um, not being quite satisfied, not thinking it's quite correct. The moment should be a little bit different. We should be a little bit different. Um, it would be better if X was happening instead of Y. How come Y happened and Z didn't happen? And um, that seems to be a subtle, but continual sort of drag uh, on our happiness and seems to be kind of a, a constant seed of, of dukkha or suffering, inherent suffering from subtle to intense. And it seems to be in our, not in our source nature, but in our kind of human nature, our personality nature, to have this um, reaction of dissatisfaction and discontent with what is. And a lot of practice is about getting in touch with what is and accepting the moment as it is and for what it is, and then uh, being able to appreciate the quality of the moment. It's uh, tathada, it's, you know, it's its own uh, actuality and the energy that that has to it. Um, so if we look at uh, the most immediate moment-to-moment uh, -moment expression of dukkha, uh, the inherent suffering that we seem to bring to the table, um, sometimes more subtle, sometimes more intense, it comes in that form of dissatisfaction with the present moment, trying to get away in some way or another from what actually exists uh, right now. And I guess from our actuality as we exist, in the present. Um, part of what exists right now, if we start looking at the content, has to do with our concrete circumstances. So I may be having a meal or getting ready to go somewhere, keeping to a work schedule, getting ready for bed, things that I have to do, things that I'm involved with, and they may be going more or less okay. Um, and when things seem to go wrong with those circumstances, then I get you know more upset but there's always perhaps a little bit of tension or anxiety about 
things going right and hoping that everything works out okay. So there's always a little dukkha even when things are going okay. Um, and then I have uh, what are seemingly internal events taking place. Um, for most of us, unless we're, I don't know, more advanced than me, uh, those internal uh, risings of thought and feeling are, are pretty uh, continuous. And I think it's kind of in the nature of the mind to have those constant internal experiences, feelings, thoughts, commentaries, reactions um, that arise and fall away. Uh, they always fall away, but they then continue to arise. And many of those thoughts and feelings are not that happy and have that sense of dukkha to them, don't promote our happiness. So we may be a little bit unhappy or discontented about something that's taking place, um, whether things are going okay or not going okay. Spilling coffee on the nice rug, if something like that takes place, then we uh, have a little bit more of a reaction or having an argument with a family member. And these, uh, uh, what we could call negative events take place pretty regularly too. Um, or I may just be upset about things that are going on internally. And those are a constant source of dukkha as well, reviewing past problems, relitigating things that have already happened, um, thinking about how much debt I'm in and worrying about money. That's a really popular one. And, uh, and these things are internal uh, ruminations. So they're not based on something happening right now, uh, but they're continuing to cause uh, turbulence and upset. And, and so that's generated from inside. And a lot of our unhappiness is generated through these sort of revolving, to use a, a, a more, you know, common word, you know, sort of neurotic patterns of thought and feeling that don't really accomplish anything except to keep us uh, in a fairly negative state. And hopefully through practice, we let go of some of that. And, and that's some of what I'm going to suggest. Um, oh, here's another popular one. Continuing the argument that I was having with someone after it's over. One of my favorites. Or even going back to an argument that I had five or 10 years ago and trying to, you know, win it this time. This time I'm going to win the argument. Um, so, and we may even notice what we're thinking or feeling, you know, and get upset about that. So why am I reviewing this argument from five years ago? I shouldn't be doing that. I thought my practice was much more advanced than that. I'm not, I shouldn't be going back to the past and worrying about that anymore. I'm over all that. I know the past isn't real. Why am I doing this? <laughs> so I could get upset about things, not only things that aren't happening anymore, but about the fact that I'm thinking about things that aren't happening anymore. And uh, that can lead to a kind of infinite regress where I can be pretty wound up uh, continuously about being, being upset about being upset. Um, having more thoughts and feelings about my thoughts and feelings. And this uh, cycle of unhappy thoughts and feelings all takes place by not being directly aware of what's actually happening and instead being carried, around, carried away by mental processes. So that's that pesky fourth skanda again. And it's also the fourth foundation of mindfulness that takes a look at that. Getting involved in the cycle of thoughts and feelings, building on each other, uh, using my favorite word, proliferating, and um, not really paying attention to the fact that much of that material is reactive and unnecessary and, and doesn't really accomplish anything. I may actually have uh, a problem that I need to resolve or a conflict that I need to resolve, but the worrying about it and getting upset about it, whether it's happening now or it happened before, or I think it's going to happen in the near future, um, is not a necessary part of the process of dealing with it. And in fact, it usually makes things worse. So there are a few ways of identifying this unhappy process and perhaps helping it to subside or become a little bit easier to deal with. 
and obviously in a general sense our practice practicing the practice of meditation um, is uh, very helpful with that because we get a little bit of awareness and mindfulness and space with our experiences and we can observe their nature a little bit more easily um, but I'll just give a few specific uh, aspects of that so one way that the Buddha suggested that we can uh, deal with this problem. And it's also very interesting just to notice that the mind even has this tendency to do this because that's kind of intriguing in its own right. Why, why would we have or be given or develop these minds that are constantly worrying about stuff that's not necessarily there? It's kind of like uh, revolving phantasms and it's a strange sort of a mental operation to be stuck with. So that's just sort of a separate thing to contemplate sometime uh, where the mind is has a tendency to be uh, attracted to and revolve around these delusory forms of thinking. Delusions are endless, but why? Um, so uh, the Buddha suggests in the fourth foundation of, uh, of, of Satipatthana, the four foundations of mindfulness, that we can identify and use mindfulness, which is a great tool to identify helpful and unhelpful thoughts and to allow the less helpful ones uh, to fade away and to get, get give them less energy while promoting the more skillful or wholesome thoughts and feelings. And uh, the Buddha believed that if we pay attention and look at which thoughts are causing suffering and which ones are seem to be more helpful and uh, and skillful uh, that we could actually give energy to the to the correct ones and let the other ones kind of be pushed away or subside and, and give them less energy so we can recognize unwholesome or unskillful thoughts and that recognition which itself is a form of awareness uh, can allow us to start choosing to abandon those less helpful thoughts and feelings and promote thinking that is more helpful Buddha compared this process to the gradual refining of ore into gold. Uh, so you can see from that metaphor that it would take some work and some attention. You've got to take the ore of our thought processes and our uh, good and bad thoughts and feelings that are all mixed together and start refining and discerning which ones are which and separating them out and seeing which ones we really want to keep. Um, and... Uh, in the Satipatthana Sutta, Buddha says that through observation and contemplation, we can learn to observe what factors cause the arising or dissolution of pleasant and unpleasant feelings, ignorant or distracted or concentrated mental states, feelings of anger, agitation, remorse, doubt, and distress, uh, all of which are on my, uh, mo my uh, greatest hits uh, list, and whether they are present or absent. When, when these negative states are absent, that's good to acknowledge and promote too. We don't have to always focus on the negative. Uh, we can say, you know, uh, as Buddha says in parts of that sutta, he says, you know, I can, I can sometimes say to myself, oh, you know, hatred and, uh, and, and delusion are absent from my thoughts right now. That's pretty cool. And so I can acknowledge that and enjoy a more positive state. Um, those are positive. There are positive thoughts and feelings that arise as well. And they are also promoted within uh, meditation. Well, we may be dealing with a lot of troublesome material at times that comes up in meditation and have to kind of process that or let it release and clear out. But meditation also promotes positive thoughts and feelings at times. And it's nice to uh, allow those to be developed and cultivated. Uh, when the Buddha talked about the jhanas, uh, which is the Pali word for uh, dhyana or dhyana as it might as it's spelled out which is the sanskrit word for meditation or deep absorptive meditation and the jhanas are gradually deepening samadhi states uh, buddha identifies feelings and qualities that he considers positive ones uh, even though they're not the final goal and says you know these are good when you start experiencing these positive feelings and, and thoughts and states of mind that's a good sign. You, you can enjoy those and then go deeper. So in the first uh, jhana, the first uh, dhyana or samadhi state, 
um, you may find that you're able to engage in contemplation and examination of your current experience. And those words in Pali are known as Vitaka and Vikara. Those are two of my favorite uh, mental factors, uh, especially Vitaka, which uh, if you look at the Abhidhamma has all kinds of nice uh, little uh, qualifiers for it, like taking the object of attention and turning it around and weighing it and examining it and feeling its qualities. So I think that's a, a, an interesting one to look into sometime, Vitaka and uh, also Vikara. Um, and emotional states like uh, PT and Sukha, which are forms of more intense or deeper and calmer uh, joy or joyfulness uh, that can be experienced in absorptive meditation. So while we don't want to get stuck on, uh, you know, bliss feelings or joyful feelings and think that, yeah, I'm going to hang on to these and cling to them and make sure they never go away, that could lead to not too good things. But they're not bad to experience those as signs that you are uh, relaxing and releasing into uh, meditation and letting go of some of the more grosser uh, negative uh, states. So um, Dogen, uh, who founded uh, Soto Zen and Suzuki Roshi after him and others after them, had another way of looking at thoughts that I, I thought was worth mentioning, uh, sort of a, a nice uh, a kind of complementary uh, way of looking at it, along with what we've been talking about, the Buddha's way of looking at uh, kusala and eight kusala, uh, skillful and unskillful thoughts. And in their case, they just sort of cut through the analysis and just said, let's look at thoughts just as I thoughts and, and not either uh, cling to them or get involved with them and, you know, think, oh, you know, this thought is really important. I have to analyze it further or reject them and say, oh, this thought is unpleasant. I got to get rid of it. But instead, just let them arise and fall away naturally. And we would just... Uh, be the observer of the thoughts. So they use a nice metaphor of allowing thoughts to uh, go by like clouds in the sky. And when you see a cloud, you could, could get involved in saying that cloud looks like a fish. And somebody else could say, no, that cloud looks like a bird. You're wrong about that. And you could get into a dispute about what kind of cloud it is, or if it's cumulus or uh, one of the other scientific names for clouds. Um, but the other thing you can do is just look at it and say, that's a cloud. And that's really a much simpler way of looking at clouds. Um, you say, that's a cloud, and it goes by, and then it's replaced by another cloud as they go by in the sky, if there's a, a little bit of a breeze. And thoughts are like that, too. They go by, and if we don't bother about them, they go away, and then another thought comes. So we can observe the thoughts that way without getting involved with that. Not only does that give us a little spaciousness and a little more relaxation and a little relief from saying, oh, oh, that thought's about the fight I had with my uncle. Oh, I, I didn't resolve that. I better, you know, get back to that and start thinking about that fight and, and upset myself. Instead, I say, no, actually, that's just a thought. I'm going to let it go. Um, and so I can be in a more... Uh, equanimous uh, state of practicing that. So that's another way of looking at thoughts and feelings that allow them to subside and become less uh, of a source of dukkha or suffering. Um, and Suzuki Roshi had a nice uh, little saying for that, which is a very nice uh, Japanese style uh, saying for that, which is Leave your front and back door open so that thoughts can come and go freely. Kind of like having your house open and letting the guests come in and out. Just don't serve them tea. So he suggested that you don't have to fight the thoughts, you don't have to reject or accept them, but you don't want to meet and greet and get involved with them. So when we practice observing the coming and going of thoughts uh, without attaching to them, and without getting involved with them, it's much less likely that we'll get upset by them and start generating more unhappy thoughts and feelings. Um, 
Another way to work with upsetting or snowballing thoughts and feelings is perhaps the most basic Zen approach of all, which is to stop putting your attention and energy into your thought and feeling process and put your attention on your breathing. And this also goes back to the most basic meditation technique taught by the Buddha um, in the Anapanasati Sutta. A little bit of a mouthful. Um, which is the, the sutta on, or sutra on full mindfulness of the breathing. When you're paying attention to the breath, it's not only an indicator of what's going on with your mental and emotional state, uh, but it's also a kind of a lever that you can use to resolve uh, your mental and emotional state. So Buddha suggested that we um, simply note what the breath is doing. When, you, when you're breathing a short breath, you acknowledge it's a short breath. When you're breathing a long breath, you acknowledge it's a long breath. Is the breath rough or is the breath smooth? Is the breath nice and continuous or is it jagged? And by observing these qualities of the breathing, the breathing has a tendency to relax and get a little slower and get a little smoother. And we might notice that if we practice that technique, basic meditation technique, that our thoughts and feelings also get a little more relaxed and a little smoother and some of the more jagged uh, thought processes start to fall away. So that's a third way of working with thoughts and feelings just by going to the breath, which is our most basic connection to the life force to our internal emotional state, to the nervous system. And it, it has a rather direct effect on what we're experiencing. The breath is both a great indicator of our mental and emotional state and a great lever to work gently with our current state of mind, just like these other techniques are nice levers to work with our state of thought and feeling. And it also, uh, the breath in particular, is something that we can bring into, from our meditation practice into, into life, because we can be walking down the street, and if we have the mindfulness to do it, we can pay attention to how we're breathing and see how we're thinking and feeling with that exercise in mindfulness, um, and to gradually reduce the suffering thoughts and feelings that we're generating and to increase our equanimity. So thank you.